about six years that I spent bouncing in and out. I built up a skill set of, you know, how to manage life as a drug addict. I, uh, I worked at a bank, which is a bad place to work when you're strung out on drugs. I you know I made the dean's list at the local community college. Like externally, yeah, everything was perfect. None of that matters to me as much as like being able to say that like my boys have been told I love you every single day of their lives, you know? Here's my hypothesis for all three of us here. Uh, I think we became addicts, became horrifically selfish pricks, <laughs> right? And then God gave us kids. Hey there, and welcome to the Recovery Crew podcast here uh, at Deep Waters Recovery. Uh, I'm Dr. Bob Baer, and today's guest is Joseph Gorordo. I'm practicing uh, pronouncing his last name. It might be just a bit too much of a gringo to pull it off, but uh, uh, Joseph is a, a, a dude who knows a lot about recovery and has uh, helped a lot of people over the years. It's, it's going to be an exciting time together today. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Deep Waters Recovery is all about a movement of transformation. Recover, heal, launch. Let go of the dependencies, uh, heal the trauma, and launch into that life of excitement and adventure and, um, and juice that we've all been looking for. So glad you're here. Uh, uh, enjoy the show. You're in the deep waters now. Well, I'm looking into the screen, and uh, both of these guys have better cameras than me, and I'm jealous. I'm having a jealousy attack. Uh, but I've got a couple of uh, entertainers who have uh, 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 crashed and burned and uh, come back uh, and are helping the world in a, in a really good way. Uh, Wes Shepard is our co-host, as I've been, you, those of you that have been listening know that he's, uh, uh, he has uh, another podcast that is pretty popular, uh, Hard Factor, and he has come to try to brush up the quality of this thing. And he's also uh, a recovery guy on fire, so his questions are juicy. Um, so welcome, Wes, again. Thank you for having me again, Dr. Bob. Good to see you. Here we go with, uh, and now we have, ju and I can't, nobody can pronounce this name. I don't give a shit. And if you listen, if you listen to him pronounce it, it's with this like real Casti Cast Cast Castiano uh, uh, Spanish. I mean, he rolls the R at least 18 times when he says, but Joseph Gorordo. I don't know how to, I, I'm just going to go with Gorordo because that took me two years to figure out how to say it. <laughs> Welcome, Joseph. Close enough. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Bob. Glad to be here. And it's Gorordo. Gorordo. Say it again. One more time, please. Gorordo. Gorordo. All right. I'm working. I'm a gringo, okay. man. My kids, my kids can't even say it. <laughs> so it's <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, but it's, it's difficult enough to say where you, you remember you because of it. If you didn't have such a beautiful, loving personality anyway, at least the name would keep people's attention. All right. Yeah. So Joseph is with us and uh, we're going to hear his story today, which is an interesting one that has so many little beautiful turns in it and uh, family stuff and creative stuff. He's a musician and, and uh, the, 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 uh, works for uh, an outfit that uses music as a central piece of recovery. It's very juicy stuff. So uh, uh, stick around here. Folks. But I want uh, Nicole, our program manager here at Deep Waters Recovery, to give a little uh, intro to... Uh, what we're up to and how to reach us. Are you there, Nicole? Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Bob. Alrighty. Yeah, um, you can reach Deep Waters Recovery at deepwatersrecovery.com. Uh, we post weekly blogs from our community, our podcast, The Recovery Crew, comes out weekly. And you can follow us on all the social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, if you have any questions about our program, comments, or if you want to be part of the podcast, please reach out. You can reach us at 512-677-7847 or email us at admin at deepwatersrecovery.com. That's admin at deepwatersrecovery.com. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Deep Waters Recovery Programs, we, we're, we're several things. A couple of the things are we're a 10-hour uh, intensive program. Right now it's online. Uh, the the, the uh, short description is recover, heal, 
launch. And you can find out more than you would ever want to know on our website. Uh, we're also a weekend intensive experience called the Deep Waters Intensive, DWI. We kind of like that. Uh, but it's uh, similar to, to the Braveheart experience that uh, Joseph and Wes know about. It's an intensive men's program that we do at the Last Resort Treatment Center once a month. Uh, yes, so that's generally what uh, Deep Waters Recovery is. And, uh, and also this podcast, we're a network of folks that try to uh, send people to the right place if you're because uh, you know deep waters isn't the only uh, uh, the, there's lots of places uh, and we want to make sure people wind up at the right uh, facility which is one of the things Joseph knows a lot about has a lot of generosity about that uh, making sure that uh, people are placed where they're going to really get help um, anyway so uh, Joseph is, uh, uh, we won't hold it against him, but he's licensed by the state of Texas to be a healer, uh, also known as a licensed chemical dependency counselor. Uh, he is a vice president. Wes, we have a vice president in our, in our midst. Uh, <laughs> he's a vice president yeah. of marketing for Recovery Unplugged. Impressive. Anybody who's paid attention to the industry uh, knows that Recovery Unplugged is one of the biggest, best, uh, juiciest uh, places to go to get healing. Uh, from addiction. He's the former president of the Austin chapter of the Texas Association Addiction Professionals, TAP. If you're in this business anywhere in Texas, you've heard of Joseph because uh, he uh, seems to be on every, I don't know how you do it. You seem to be in there somewhere doing service. Uh, uh, grateful for that. Um, he was awarded several different things, the Terry D. Hale Professional of the Year Award in 2019. That's a big deal for those of us that are in this world. It's usually given to people that are that go way beyond what their job is, which is what Joseph does always. Um, he's built a, a lot of different programs. I met you at the Last Resort Treatment Center when you were building that marketing program out there. Uh, so he, and he's, you've always been the guy that, you know, marketing is one thing and healing is another, but you've always had a hand in both, which is a unique, uh, a unique uh, thing about you that I've always appreciated. Uh, he's also the founder of Austin Sober Dad, which tells you where his real priorities are. Um, Joseph, welcome to the, to the recovery crew. I've been trying to get you here for a while. And, uh, uh, so tell, wanna, we're, we're hopeful that you'll just kind of tell your story. What was it like? What happened and what it's like now? And then we'll kind of poke around at it a little bit. All right. Let's poke away. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the lovely intro loosely based on the nice things that I told you to say about me. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, most of that's true. I, I like to think, but um, it's, 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 it's good to finally be on here. I, I'm a podcast guy. I like podcasts. I like recovery and clinical work and music and you do too. And so it's, it's awesome to, to finally get to be on with you. Uh, so you love throwing these really broad questions at me. So what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Um, I guess the Cliff Notes version is, you know, grew up kind of a, just a kid that didn't fit, right? Um, my last name's Gordo. Most of my family lives in Mexico. Uh, I'm the first person uh, in my family to be born in the United States, which meant that like from the get go, uh, I didn't fit in. You know, I was, I was the cousin that lived in the US, right? But then mm -hmm. in Laredo where I grew up, you know, I look very not Mexican. <laughs> so, um, so I stood out there too, right? And so I just, I never, you know, and you know, I identify as Mexican. I grew up speaking Spanish and English. You know, my mom talks about how I didn't really know I was speaking two languages. I just knew English for this person and Spanish for this person. And so, um, you know, that's how I grew up. And, you know, so from the very beginning, kind of not fitting and already straying into, you know, using things outside myself to fix myself from a really early age, like before we even get to alcohol and drugs, um, immersing myself in books, fantasy novels, Lord of the Rings, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, I, I was reading Stephen King when I was like 10, which I don't think is, is really a, a super healthy or common thing for 10 year olds to do. Um, now that I have a 10 year old. Yeah. I would have, no, no, not at all. Um, but also even like TV, you know, uh, 
coming home. You don't hear this term too much anymore, but latchkey kid, right? I grew up in a single parent household. It was my mom and my grandma. Um, So I would come home from school and, you know, TV was another way of, you know, not feeling scared uh, to be alone in a house by myself, you know, not, not to, not to think about me. Right. Basically. And I even have a really vivid memory of, you know, one day I was probably like eight or nine, you know, getting out of the shower one night, you know, and going straight to the TV and my mother saying something to me along the lines of like, you go to that TV, like if it's God to you or something. I was mm. like, oh. uh, but, you know, I, I think that those are kind of telling signs of the ism before the alcohol showed up. Right. Right. Um, and even within those things, you know, Stephen King, you know, and the, and the movies that I would watch, I was always kind of attracted to the darker side of things, you know, um, I remember the movie Warriors was big for me when I was a kid, uh, Blood In, Blood Out, Goodfellas, things about gangs and violence and murder. And, uh, I was into that, you know, that outsider rebel thing. Mm. Um, you know, got into alcohol and drugs, uh, I think the way a lot of people do, you know, took a little, you know, stole some booze from my dad, um, tried that, um, stole some weed from my dad, tried that, um, I didn't fit into that like pusher, you know, kids experimenting thing though, because like I, when those things happened, it was by myself, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to drink with my buddies and we're going to no, it was Joseph alone drinking and drugging um, from, you know, right about the age, like 10 to 12, somewhere in there. Mm. And, you know, I do remember from an early age that like, it made me feel confident right like I talked about feeling like I'm not like I didn't fit in with my family in Mexico because I was the cousin that lived somewhere else um so like family get-togethers and stuff you know in Mexico it's not super weird for a kid to have like some beer or um I would I would get like rum and coke because I could walk around with it and no one would know that it was not just a coke and I remember having like that social lubricant like I feel less awkward I can hang out with my cousins and crack a joke and not be so insecure. Right. Yeah. Um, So there was an effect produced. Yeah. The low low self-esteem stuff doesn't necessarily cause addiction, but man, it, uh, it gets us on a track where we can, we have a good shot at it. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um. You know, so, so I, I, we roll into high school and I'm kind of following the typical high school kid trajectory. You know, I'm smoking a little bit more weed, drinking on the weekends, um, always taking it a little bit further than my friends. You know, I was always that guy that was like, come on, like, let's, let's do one more bong load. Let's drink one more beer. Um, there's this one spring break on South Padre Island. There was probably like 25 of us in a condo. And I remember waking up real early and rolling a joint and going around this condo at like, I don't know, 10 a.m., slowly waking everyone up one at a time, asking them to come smoke a joint with me. Mm. And no one would smoke it with me. You know, like, I think that's another just like, eh, Joseph was, was going a little, a little harder than everybody else. It's, one, it's um, one thing when they won't stay up and use with you, but it's another thing when you can't get them up and you're up the next morning trying to get it's another yeah. beautiful level. I can relate to that. It looks like Wes can relate to that a little. Oh yeah, I used to I used to feed people Adderall just so they could stay up and drink with me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know that same spring break trip, I remember getting so drunk and wasted that I passed out in the shower at like like fully clothed at like eight o'clock. And I have these flashes of people being like, Hey, Joseph's passed out in the shower. And the thing is, I had already hit what I wanted at that point, you know, like I wasn't drinking to try to hang out with girls and, you know, we used to say weedy, weedy, wada, wada, like, you know, talking yeah, to, yeah. like I, I was, I was going for nullification, you know, mm. so like to black out eight o'clock just meant that I got to where I wanted to be quicker than everybody else. Mm. Um, but so, you know, I, I was always kind of in a hurry and I always wanted like to live life and to be ahead and be bigger and older than I was. And so, you know, I graduated high school, which I almost failed. I almost didn't walk high school because I was failing yearbook, which is the hardest class to fail in the history of the world. You got to really but, fuck up to, to fail yeah. a yearbook. 
yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it, it was like three days before graduation day that, that we found out that I would, in fact, get to walk. And they gave me like a 72. <laughs> year book. But so, um, you know, so basically, as soon as I graduated high school, I'm like looking for an apartment. You know, I moved out of my mom's house. Um, I was a smart kid, so I'd actually gotten into the uh, honors program at the local community college. So I had free college. I started working in the dean's office part-time while also working full-time at the mall mm. to sustain myself. And basically my free time aside from school and two jobs was spent getting high. And when you're 18 and you're the first kid in your group in your circle to have an apartment, like it all comes to you. Yeah. You know, so alcohol, weed, cocaine, uh, mushrooms, you know, pills, um, and some harder stuff started showing up, you know, some older cats that weren't part of my immediate circle started showing up, right? It's a free place to party. Um, you know, so heroin kind of started coming into my orbit and I, you know, I, uh, eventually was dating a girl who was a recovered heroin addict. Um, and, uh, she was living with me and just somehow the idea came, right? Like, you know what? I'm going to try heroin. I'm going to try it one time. And, uh, you know, another friend of ours called me, um, and she wanted to try it too. And so we, we got my girlfriend, we're like, Hey, let's go, let's go score some stuff. Let's do this. And, um, I remember just before shooting up for the first time, looking at my friend who was doing it for me and saying like, this isn't going to fuck up my life. Is it? And mm. she said, no, I promise. It's just this one time. And, uh, you know, you can connect the dots. It wasn't just one time, right? That led to the next six years of bouncing in and out of treatment centers, you know, trying the geographical cure, going from Laredo to San Antonio, moving to Mexico, spending a, a whole year in uh, a Mexican rehab where I had to be in silence 23 hours out of the day. Like all this stuff happened. And, um, you know, just really, you know, I was like from the very beginning of when heroin came in, I was that lost kid that uh, would kind of go with the flow and do what it took to stay high. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you name it, I've done it. Like smuggled drugs, robbed people, stolen from stores, stolen from my family, pawned stuff, broken into houses. Um, you know, just creating damage at a massive scale um and really you know losing a lot of my identity too you know B bobby mentioned that I'm, uh, I'm a musician you know i had been playing guitar from the age of 10 and mm. man all those guitars got pawned real fast yeah you know and the, the the big thing for me was that like i never i never wanted to stop getting high I never wanted to quit doing drugs. I wanted bad things to stop happening, right? I wanted to stop getting arrested and I wanted to stop being homeless and I wanted to stop making my mom cry and ruining relationships and all that kind of stuff. That's what I wanted, right? Um, and over those years, you know, it was just about six years that I spent bouncing in and out. I built up a skill set of, you know, how to manage life as a drug addict. Yeah. And the last six months that I was using, I had found the secret sauce. I uh, was getting high the way I wanted to. I was living with my mom. My mom thought I was sober. I had a home group. I had a sponsor. I was the H&I chair for my group. Um, I, uh, I worked at a bank, which is a bad place to work when you're strung out on drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and I pulled a 4.0 and made the dean's list at the local community college like externally yeah everything was perfect i had two girlfriends look at poor wes over here nodding his head so hard that he's gonna break his neck. i've worked yeah. at a bank uh before uh, so yeah. i yeah i get it yeah yeah and you know the the temptation of like you know i could slip a 20 out of here call my dealer and then just get it back in to the you know work it back into the till later today just, anyway but, you know, externally, everything was good. Yeah. And the feeling that I had in the mornings when I woke up, not the dope sick feeling, but the in here feeling, that like desperate, alone, 
hollowness. You know, I realized that that wasn't going to go away. Mm. You know, and, you know, that was the first time I ever voluntarily went to treatment. You know, I went to my mom, you know, uh, I remember it was a Sunday. I went to my mother and said, hey, you know, I, I relapsed. I need to go back to treatment. I'll go tomorrow. I need you to give me some money right now. You know, my mom, you know, gave me money and I went and I did my thing. And uh, I'll, I'll spare you some gory details on that last day because they don't really matter. But the point is, you know, the next day, you know, my mom drives me to a facility in Center Point, Texas. And uh, when I did the pre-screen with this facility, I remember they asked me if I had any kind of religious affiliation as part of the pre-screen. And I said, I guess Cocaine Anonymous. And the guy on the phone said, oh, me too. Yeah. And, and, and I took that as a sign. And then I asked him, I said, is this the place where Chris Raymer works? Because <laughs> I, I had heard Chris Raymer tapes and I was scared of him. <laughs> and they said, no, we're not where Chris Raymer works. And I was like, all right, great, let's go. <laughs> um, I love Chris, his stuff's great. But at the time I wasn't ready to hear it, you know? <laughs> But so, uh, you know, so I'm off to treatment and, and really, you know, if, if you were to ask me what was different the last time I went to treatment versus every other time before that, mm. it's, I listened, I didn't have any more ideas. I followed directions. Um, you know, they told me work these steps. I worked the steps, you know, they said, Hey, this guy's going to be your sponsor. He's going to hear your fourth step. I said, okay, I didn't have an opinion, you know, um, they said, this is your therapist. Talk to her. Okay, I talked to her. They said, go to Sober Living in Kerrville, Texas. I said, okay, that's fine. You know, it was just whatever they told me to do, I did. You had and, you had Wes up until that last one. Go to Sober Living. Yeah, I was with you. I was with you until Sober <laughs> Living. <laughs> <laughs> but the, oh. Wes chose not to go to Sober Living. I think he struggled a little bit more than he had to because of that. that that's yeah. kind of... Yeah, there was some circumstances around it but i wanted to go yeah you know i actually you know I, my mom is an old school hispanic catholic mom you know and in in, in the the mexican culture right your kids never grow up right it's me mm. they'll come home right mommy and poppy and I, you call your kids yeah. mommy and poppy yeah i i call the baby mommy i don't call the boys poppy that much no but anyway <laughs> but so when I told her I would, I needed to go to sober living in Kerrville, Texas, I had the opposite issue of what most guys in treatment have, right? Usually the parents want them to go to sober living right. and the kid is like, no, let me come home. And no, my mom was like, why come home? What are you going to do in Kerrville? Right. What, what is there in Kerrville? Right. And I was just like, I'm going. And I think that also did a lot for my recovery because my mom was mad about it. You know, she felt like I was abandoning her is mm. what I assume, right? Yep. Because she picked me up from rehab, you know, we did the traditional, I just picked my kid up from rehab stuff, right? So haircut, a little bit of new clothes, you know, lunch at Chili's. And then uh, she took me to the sober house and gave me a hundred bucks and said, that's it. Mm. You know, if you're not sober, don't call me ever again. Yep. And she meant it, you know, like she really and that didn't, meant it. She had to get a little education to get there. Just like, you know, a lot of the folks we work yeah. with, their families have to yeah. get educated on this disease that anything yeah. less than that is not going to help. Yeah. Well, this is the crazy part. She never participated in a single family group or family weekend because uh -huh. we don't talk about that stuff. That's right. Behind closed doors, let alone in a room full of strangers. Right. Yeah. But she got there. I think because of resentment. Ah. Right? Like she was, you know, this is all me hypothesizing, right? But yep. she got to the same place that she needed to get to just by a roundabout. Yeah. Because the, the goal the goal for family members is to stop the obsessive enabling. And it really doesn't matter how you get there. Yeah, yeah. She stopped. I pissed her off. <laughs> I finally pissed her off. It wasn't the the bailing me out of jail. It wasn't the stealing from the family. It was the I'm not coming home. Yeah. You know, which I mean, maybe it's a cultural thing, but, uh, so, you know, so, so then I, I'm in Kerrville and I mean, like, as far as like recovery program goes, like I, I continue to just do what I was told, you know, I took suggestions. Um, I got a job, 
you know, uh, working at Denny's, flipping pancakes in Kerrville, Texas. You know, I dove into the fellowship. There was a group of guys that were all friends that had about a year sober that sort of ended up sponsoring me and my group of guys at the sober house. You know, I, I built up a core group of friends there, you know, that there's, there's four of us that are still sober, still keep in touch. Mm. And, um, you know, one of them's a doctor. One of them's running a treatment center out in Lubbock. The other one runs an oil field in South Texas, like have all gone on to do great things. And those guys that, that I was in sober living with, I may not talk to them for a couple months uh, at a time, but you know, if something goes down, I can pick up that phone. No questions asked, you know, and, and there's no, there's no small talk catch up. I can jump right into the real stuff with them yeah. regardless um, but anyway, so, you know, I'm in, I'm in Kerrville, Texas and I'm doing my thing and I'm working and I'm going to the meetings and I'm going to, you know, I'm uh, floating the river and hanging out and hanging out with girls. Uh, I met my lovely wife uh, during that time period in my life. And, uh, you know, things are going great. And at nine months sober, you find out she's pregnant, mm -hmm. you know. Um, which is, was a terrifying thing. You know, I had just gotten my shit together, right? I had just learned how to pay rent without selling drugs. Uh, and, and now I'm supposed to be in charge of another person, you know? Uh, but there was no question in my mind that we were going to have that kid. And, uh, you know, uh, I started a whole different journey, right? And learning to heal some of my father wounds and um, even grandfather wounds, right? Yeah. Um, you know, finding my own version and kind of definition of manhood and, and what it was that I wanted to pass on to my children, mm -hmm. how to teach them, you know, what it is to be a, a man, you know, and a father and all that kind of stuff. Um, but so I feel like I'm going a little long here, but you know, no, you're good. At, at the point when family entered the picture, you know, I was kind of a hippie kid. You know what I mean? Like I didn't want anything. I didn't, I didn't want a house. I wasn't concerned with those things. And I still, to some degree, am not. But once I had a child, it was like, I want everything for this child. You're still a hippie. You know? What are you talking about? You're still a hippie. <laughs> Can we see that? He's got, he's got a tattoo under his ear. He hit, sometimes he has an earring, I think. Yep. We'll get to yeah. that. We'll get to the bass yeah. cleft side. So I just got this one on a yeah. Saturday. That's yeah. New one. Wow. Nice. Um, yeah. You're a hippie. You're at least a hippie. You're probably even at another, maybe a little hipster. I don't know. I don't. I can't quite figure it out. <laughs> I get. You know, I like bougie coffee, so maybe I'm a hipster. I don't know. <laughs> but so once, what I'm saying is, that like, once my kid was in the picture, or I knew he was on the way, it was like I can't just stay in Kerrville, Texas, working at Denny's. You know. Um, so that's the point where I got a job working at a boys' youth facility that paid a little bit better than Denny's, and I got back into school. Mm. And uh, went back to school, got licensed as a, I got my CI license to be an LCDC intern, started working at a facility running their IOP program. Loved IOP, you know, because it was real deal, right? It wasn't treatment bubble. It was like, I, I could go get high after group, you know, kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I worked my way from Kerrville, you know, um, kind of cut my teeth there, but limited opportunities for my kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, ended up coming to Austin, which is where I was born. So kind of returning home. And uh, it's like Kerrville only has two things, right? Treatment centers and that festival. Yeah. Yeah. That Kerrville <laughs> Folk Festival, which is actually really fun. Yeah. But uh, for, a music, you know, they got, for a music guy like you, right? Which yeah. I know, I, I know you find your way back to music with this story here. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to rush you toward that. So go ahead. Yeah. But so, um, you know, so I started working in the treatment center here in Austin and kind of, you know, finding kind of my space clinically and uh, around six years sober, this is actually kind of where music starts to come back in, right? At around six years sober, um, I find myself in like a pretty dark place, you know, um, things are off with the wife, we're fighting a lot, I'm burnt out on working in treatment, you know, um, and, and Bob, you, you know this. I mean, when you work in treatment, you get to see a lot of miracles happen. You get to see a lot of beautiful people, you know, rise from the ashes and families heal and all that stuff. But then you see a lot of people crash and burn. Yeah. You know, you see a lot of death. Even just today as we're recording this, you know, um, someone we played golf with two weeks ago, 
you know, um, passed away of an overdose. And, um, you know, I was just, I was tired and you know, I was tired emotionally in my relationship and my profession. And it, it was the one time I really wanted to drink since I got mm-hmm. sober. You know, my wife said, Normie, we have, we keep wine in the house. And I was home alone one night and just in a dark place. And I remember looking at, uh, the bottle of wine in the pantry and looking at like really looking at it <laughs> and yeah. losing my shit and falling on the floor, sobbing like a child, mm. you know? Mm. Um, the next day I woke up, it was Easter Sunday. I knew something had to change, you know? So good, good Catholic boy that I was, I went to church, mm. didn't, didn't find what I was looking for at church. Mm. Um, but I had a client at the time who went to a, to a church, uh, uh, one of those big non-denominational churches in Austin. Mm-hmm. And that client had given us all invitation cards for Easter service. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to go to that church next. You know what? The Catholic church didn't do it for me. Let me go to this church. I got nothing else to do. Right. And I walked into that church and the second I crossed the thresholds, just, sobbing crying um so you know that that begins me kind of changing and growing in my relationship with my higher power right um finding a separate community well some of it about the uh uh i don't know i don't even know this but i'm i'm guessing the uh the christian rock music uh passionate thing was happening yes no contemporary yeah, yeah well, i think the, music. the mu the music hit the ears and it was like ah <laughs> you know? i've been there brother i'm telling you you know sometimes the christian stuff is just a little bit i'm a little bit jaded but i'm telling you christian rock music just gets in me and then i'm like some of it's pretty good some <laughs> yeah. of it's pretty good Damn good. A lot, of, a lot of it's not but some of it's really good but so like that moment you know so that was like the deep the darkest part of my recovery but then like walking to that church kind of broke the dam to where it was like, there's work to do here. Yeah. You know? So I dove into some faith stuff, but I also dove into taking care of myself physically, you know, like not eating crap and drinking Red Bull all the time and trying to exercise. And I dove back into music um, and started um, writing again and practicing classical guitar again um to to build up those skills and just finding like the joys in life i think that you know when i got sober my joys were the joys of a 15 year old right because i had stopped developing so i was like river and video games and this and that and then i didn't get a chance to find how to take care of myself because i i had to take care of kids yep you know and it wasn't until that six year mark so here's here's one of the just as a little uh, bouncing off of that, one one of our yeah. our buddies, uh, Bill Wigmore, uh, has yeah. been on, has been on this podcast, and uh, you know he he I, I've quoted this many times on this podcast. I think, I think it's so important. It's actually central to the Deep Waters uh, movement, uh, and that is yeah. So people that relapse say, what 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 are, what are the two things we always they always say? That, why did they relapse? I'm just it's kind of a question for. Oh. The- Oh, you're asking me? Yeah. I mean, because, you know, they, they quit doing the work. Right. Or, or, or it's money and women. Which... Yeah, yeah. Money, <laughs> right. It's one, of, it's one of those. It's money, women, stop going to meetings, stop calling my sponsor. Those are usually the pat answers, right? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Bill Wigmore, who's, who's a priest uh, that likes to be a little irreverent occasionally, uh, said, ah, that's bullshit. It's bullshit. You didn't find some me- something meaningful to replace that to be, once you started recovery and you still had that hole. And if, because I, I, I found that to be true. Uh, uh, I have to find something meaningful and family can do it. Relationship, kids, all that. But actually you got to find something that's really soulful for your own personal soul. I think yeah. uh, to, uh, to as a, as the third leg of you got to heal the trauma, you got to get sober and you better find some meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times I talk to sponsees about like, you know, when we talk about spirituality in the context of recovery, right? I think most people default to like, oh, they mean like prayer meditation. Mm. And I try to encourage them to broaden that spirituality to the idea that it's anything that feeds your spirit, right? So if 
and you know whatever that creativity is you know if it's exercise if it's writing if it's music if it's baking if it's you know painting if it's reading books just like find what feeds your spirit maybe it's live music right maybe it's concerts maybe you know maybe it's uh creating little miniature replicas of civil war battle i don't know right <laughs> but like spirituality is, is activities that feed your spirit and that doesn't just mean sitting quietly meditating yep. or on your knees praying you yep. know carl carl jung dr jung who you and i have studied uh yeah. extensively taught he, he referred to it at, and, and aa is really what i think is the popular manifestation of his uh personal uh, ideas of personality and psychology but he he refers to it as the um, as active imagination right we have to give that that unspoken part of our soul uh, a language right to speak yeah. through so for some of us it's I like that for some of it is that, because it's mysterious and it is an 11th step thing it is a connection with a higher power because creativity is a language of the mystery right yeah artists bring the language of the mystery to the world to try to say well this is what we think god is sort of you know yeah. like breaking bad that show yeah. is god isn't it <laughs> i don't know about that you know for somebody it is you know <laughs> somebody had a spiritual experience with that show somewhere you know <laughs> I, I right. promise. Somewhere there's some some guy telling his drunk log in a meeting in a basement, talking about how he was watching Breaking Bad, smoking meth. Yeah, and it hit him. Yeah. You know? Creativity is is yeah. is eleventh step stuff. Thank you for saying that. It's de-emphasized. So, yeah. It's de-emphasized in our in our recovery world. I I think. Yeah. <clears throat> and 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 Bob, really, you know, that all happened about a year before I met you. Mm. And the guy that I was you know, prior to that kind of dark night of the soul kind of rebirth thing was very different from the guy that you met at TLR all those years ago, mm. you know, like, um, that guy was sober and alive, but I wasn't thriving. I wasn't growing anymore. I wasn't, I had lost my joy for recovery. Mm. Yeah. You know? Um, and and so you know when i met you we were working at, at tlr and it was a great program but it um you know i wasn't for whatever reason it just wasn't jiving with me and i was like maybe it's time to leave the, the treatment world you know mm -hmm. maybe it's time to go do one of those coding boot camps and <laughs> and go work at one of the big tech companies in austin right oh uh, yeah yeah um, seriously that ca that went through your that was the plan that was the plan. I actually shared that plan with a buddy of mine, and he was like, I'm going to do that. And he did it. He planted a seed in someone else. Yeah, but I was getting ready. You know, I was seriously contemplating doing something else with my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when, you know, Recovery Unplugged showed up, and they were like, hey, we do music and recovery and clinical work. And I was like, check, check, check. Yeah. Um, you know, and... Uh, I almost went to work over there too, as you know, and I went check, check, check. And then I also told them, you know, and I've got these great ideas about some other shit that you could do. Yeah. And they sort of went uncheck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's like, there's, there's no comments box on this, box. <laughs> but you know, but I think that, you know, getting the unplugged, you know, cause like the, it, all these are different pieces of our lives as humans, right. As people in recovery, right. As you know, spirituality and, physical well-being and relationship well-being but also finding some sort of meaning uh in your work right yeah. and recovery and plug really kind of hit that for me and it was like the last piece of the puzzle um to like being in a place where like my soul is content you know yeah. I, I, i'm not looking for the next thing anymore like i'm here yeah you know um, how about that you know, it just occurred to me, I, I don't even know how to ask this question, but, you know, this story started out with this uh, little boy that felt separate, didn't feel like yeah. he could fit in, maybe just yeah. scared all the time. And now you got yourself, after all of this work, you're with one of the biggest outfits in the country, and you're a vice president of this outfit, and, and you know, you get to be yourself. Uh, I've seen you, I know that part of Recovery Unplugged is that, you know, people get up on stage and you... You don't have to be perfect. You get to be imperfect. And um, all of this stuff, I it almost feels full circle 
It almost yeah. kind of feels full circle to me. Yeah. Well, it's that's one of the beauties of it. And what I like as, you know, with Unplugged as an employer is that, like, I get to be myself. Like, the way I am with, with you guys right now on this podcast is, is the same way I was on the phone with the CEO an hour before. Yeah. Is the same way I am with families. Is the same way I am with my family. Is the yeah. same way I show up at my meeting. Like, uh, like this is it. Isn't that the work? <laughs> I had, I had, a, I had an old mentor that said the real, the, the the real sign of a master is he's pretty much exactly the same person whether he's talking to a bunch of CEOs or playing on the floor with a kid. Uh, uh, that, yeah. That's uh, you know. I don't know if any of us have quite made it to that yet. Yeah, I don't know if I've mastered anything. <laughs> actually, actually, Joseph, you get him on the golf course, he's a little more irreverent than he is in public. I'll just say that, just slightly more. But uh, I guess you have boundaries. I, you're one of those people. Yeah. Have you heard of those there's, boundaries? There's some boundaries. There's some boundaries here. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's some stories I probably won't won't tell on this yeah. podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you're yeah, also, just... one, one, one of the things that I admire about you, uh, Joseph, is how, uh, you know, you're, you're, and I don't know if you're ready to transition to this uh, uh, sense, but, uh, you know, how important your family is, how, how you have this really executive level traveling around the country job uh, with a lot of pressures, I'm sure. I, I know I know this world <laughs> and uh, also holding positions on boards that uh, have pressure on you. And then you, you know, people, lots of people having you do interviews. Like I mean, I've watched you. I mean, you're very busy and you're always kind of calm, <laughs> but I think I'm really poking around at uh, the family aspect of this. I know how much you love yeah. that. And uh, uh, I don't, I don't even know what the question is, but I want to invite you to yeah. all of us have a dream of having this view. And maybe it's not as all white picket fancy as it looks from the outside, but it looks like you're doing pretty good, especially around the family stuff. I mean, it, it, it's pretty white picket fancy a lot of the time. I mean, we have our problems, right, for sure. And I mean, my, my boys have their things that we struggle with, that, you know, behaviors that we try to correct. But it's pretty good, man. I can't, I can't imagine much better. But, you know, what's really – one thing that's really cool is from the beginning of my clinical career, right? Like in one of my first cohorts of IOP clients, you know, 10 years ago, um, we were doing a group one time where we were taking turns in the hot seat and, but only positive feedback, right? right. It was, you know, everybody in the group is going to tell everybody else two things that they admire in that person. Right. And, you, you know, when you run these kind of groups, right, once everyone is gone, all the clients kind of look at you like, well, are you going to get in the seat? Right, right. <laughs> you know? and, uh, clinically, I don't know if it's appropriate, but I did it. I got in the middle of the seat and, you know, like half the clients said, like, I love how much you talk about your family or how much you care about your family. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I didn't even know it was like a parent, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I didn't have the best dad, you know? Um, and neither did my wife. You know, we both grew up in single mom households. And uh, giving my kids a different experience than that mm. is probably more important to me than anything else. Yeah. You know, how about that and, one, Wes? How about that one, Wes? That hit anywhere inside your body? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's something I work on on a daily basis is showing the, showing the love that might've been not so, uh, you know, yeah. available to me. Yeah. Yeah. Home. And I mean, like, you know, we, I own a, a home. We have nice things. You know, I like my chair that I'm sitting in. <laughs> like, you know, we, we've got cars and all this other stuff, but like none of that matters to me as much as like being able to say that, like my boys have been told, I love you every single day of their lives, mm. you know, yeah. um, that unless I'm away because of work, like, they get hugs and kisses and cuddles and no matter how much eye rolling. <laughs> yeah. How, yeah. how, what, what are the ages? My, I think the eye rolling started at about 11, 10, 10, yeah. 10. <laughs> my old, Nine. so I, I, I've got 10, eight and two. Right. Um, so not a whole lot of eye rolling yet. 
No, but he, he's real sweet. I think he'll he'll stay pretty, you know, <laughs> pretty sweet like that for a while longer. My eight year old is the sassier one, who's a little bit like, oh, yeah, I love here's, you too. <laughs> here's here's my here's my hypothesis for all three of us here, uh, and you guys can tell me what you you can uh, do. Give me your research data on it, but it's I think we became addicts, became horrifically selfish pricks, <laughs> right? And then God gave us kids because I'm telling you, not recovery therapy, healing work, none of that has helped me to be less selfish as much as uh, there's something that happens. I, I, you know, my dad used to say, I'll give a body part for you if I need to. Um, yeah. That makes me want to cry a little bit because I, you know, my dad was an old tough guy, but he was, he was there <laughs> and I could feel his love. But I, you know, my daughter has knocked a lot of the selfish prick off of me. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're a pretty good dad yourself, you know? I mean, you've done good with that with that daughter of yours at college now. But, um, I mean, that's and, – and don't get me wrong. My dad's not a bad dude. He did the best he could with what he could, you know? I've saved myself a lot of grief and resentment by operating under the assumption that everybody's doing the best they can. Yeah. And that's, just it but um you know it, it that has all the things that i didn't get has been a driver in what i want them to get you right. know and, and all the, like i said the other stuff like you know being able to take them on vacation and stuff like that like i, I worry that they're spoiled and i try to tell them like do you know how many times you've been to disney world <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but they know their love you know even when they're being yelled at and scolded you know they know that they're loved yeah. Uh, and that's I well, can't say the same right well I've tried a different thing that I know it's going to sound bizarre to anybody listening and uh, but he, you know how I have never disciplined her once really? I haven't taken away shit one, one time I took away her phone for three days and she said thank you I needed some space from it <laughs> it's like of course she's an easy kid she's, she was always an easy kid I think but I think it's also Part of a, uh, I'm suggesting this as a new parenting style. Uh, you don't have to tell them how great they are all the time, but you definitely don't. I, I don't know about this hitting shit. Now that I, I'm against oh, hitting. No. no, we don't hit, but we take stuff. There away. will be no hitting. I will not allow it. No, there's no hitting. But I guess um, you got to do a little discipline, huh? Is that what, is that yeah. the argument? All I right. mean, one time we, we took absolutely everything out of one of their rooms. Like he had a bed. <laughs> <laughs> doors off the hinges and shit like that do you have that no 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 we haven't gotten to doors that's off a the teenage yet. thing that's a teenager thing yeah <laughs> most of the girls i dated before my wife were doors off the hinges <laughs> <laughs> i think i've been pretty lucky i i had a really easy kid in it but uh yeah. one day at a time she's in college and uh telling me about her dating oh my god all right let's not go nope. there nope um nope. so Anyway, I th uh, Joseph, it's uh, your story is just you, you've got just such a beautiful, calm soul, brother. And I don't know, maybe you were a wacko addict that was bouncing off the walls and shit, but uh, uh, somehow whatever you've been doing is the right thing. And I'm telling you, a lot of people get a lot from it. Uh, you have leadership in the community that is, uh, that is uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, helping individuals, but also helping us professionals in the business who are, it's a crazy business. And, and look at you. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. You know, I can see the truth in that. And truth. You're a little bit like, uh, you know who you remind me of is Tevye in uh, Fiddler on the Roof. You know the show? Uh, if I've never I were seen a rich Fiddler. Man. I've seen a lot of shows, but not Fiddler. But if I, I were a song. Rich man. It's, it's Rich Man. If I, yeah. right. So anyway, there's a scene in there where Tevye is on the milk. He's a milk salesman. And uh, one of the old guys comes up and said, we cannot, uh, we cannot fight. We are spiritual people. We must be calm and kind. He says, you are right. Right? And another guy comes up and says, but Tevi, uh, we have to fight. They're taking away our traditions. And he says, uh, you are right. And then another guy comes up and says, uh, he is right and he is right. They cannot both be right. And Tevi says, you are also right. <laughs> and, uh, so Wes, I don't, you don't know Joseph, but that's how he is. That's the kind of leader he is. He sees a little bit of truth in in everything, and you know. Whereas I'm pretty much no, that's no. We gotta 
no, that's wrong. We can't be doing. Well, you know, whether you view everybody's telling a little bit of the truth, or you view everybody's lying to me a little bit, <laughs> the the actual situation and the end result is the same. Right, right. <laughs> you know? Spoken like a tr- spoken like a true vice president of marketing. Just- <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, Joseph, anything else you want to share with us today? I think you've really kind of unpacked your story in a real genuine, authentic way, which is what we're mostly interested in at Deep Waters and uh, here on the Recovery Crew. Or Wes, do you have anything? This guy's been around a while. Yeah, no, I, I just listening to it, a lot of it resonated with me about the, you know, the little boy, you know, kind of not fitting in. And so it was just, it was just good to hear. I mean, I don't, I don't really have any specific questions. Um, just, it's always nice to just hear a story that you can relate to in this. And, and so thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah, right on. Right on. Say, just, say, say just in, uh, in closing, I know that you wrote in your blog, which uh, is really well written and we're going uh, to, that'll be coming out in a couple of days after this is out. Uh, but uh, the, at the end, you said something about quiet and how, how stillness and quiet yeah. is important to you. And um, would you say just a little bit about that before we close here? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess that's a little bit tied to like how I functioned as an addict too. Right. Like, you know, always had to be moving and searching and finding and, you know, in the middle of a group of people and uh, you know, in my work today, right. Like you were saying like, Oh, Joseph knows everybody, you know, like I still, talk a lot and talk to a lot of people and you know many times i'm like on a zoom but i'm also texting and emailing and all simultaneously um and i can do that and it's good for me and i thrive in that but i also have to make space to not do anything um because if not i'll just be productive all the time like whether it's like making bread or reading a book or you know uh, starting a garden like i'll just find a project and i have to consciously create moments where the phone goes away and i'm not watching anything i'm not really listening to anything i'm like i need that space to just I'm not even trying to meditate you know what i mean like yeah. it's not even that you know it usually happens in this chair you know but just like a moment to just reflect yeah. um kurt vonnegut who's uh one of my favorite authors of all time and i actually have a tattoo inspired by him uh he in one of his books uh cat's cradle you know, he, he mentions, I'm, I'm not going to try to quote it directly, but he says something about how when living life and experiencing something that's really nice, it's important to take a second look around and say, this is nice. Hmm. You know, and that's what quiet is for me is like, let me take a second look around, yeah. you know, and, and find all the nice things. Yeah. You know? Thank you, man. Especially this year. Especially this year. We're about to, uh, yeah, the, the, this year has slowed things down in, so, in a lot of ways uh, for many of us. Uh, some, and there's been a lot of pain related to it, but also there's been some, uh, maybe we need to slow down just a little bit. Um, but uh, but we, better, we better wind this up before we turn this into an Eckhart Tolle uh, uh, meditation. <laughs> But uh, I think you, I think you're a real good testament to what recovery looks like and how to be pretty functional in the world. See, we're not all just wacko living under the bridge, folks. Look at this guy. No. Look yeah. at this guy. <laughs> all right, thanks, Joseph. Um, Thank you, Bob. Thanks, yeah, Bob. man. So, thanks, so good to have you here uh, to bring your your wisdom about the about life and recovery. Um, so why don't you say a little bit about, you know, uh, f- folks are going to hear this and going to want to know more about Recovery Unplugged, know more about you and know how to get some help when they need it. Why don't you put that uh, out? Yeah, so um, so you can always go to recoveryunplugged.com. Um, if you want to read about uh, recovery and parenting, you can check me out on austinsoberdad.com. There's also a Facebook page for that. Um, that comes in waves. I'll post a bunch for a while and then stop for like six months, but that's there. Um, and if, and if anybody wants to reach directly out to me, like I'm an open book, 
you know, you can you can email me at josephg at recoveryunplugged.com. You can call me on my cell phone, 512-213-9007. Uh, anything I could do to help anybody ever, you know, nice. if I can, I will. Nice. Thanks, Joseph. Um, so thanks for coming to the, being on the recovery crew. You are, uh, you are now a formal crew member. Uh, you get a t-shirt? Yeah. Well, that's, we're, we're, we're just talking about that. Uh, we're soon, soon. I appreciate a good t-shirt. You know? <laughs> I'll have to, I'm going to call Joseph Gerardo and find out the best deal on t-shirts and stuff like that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Hey, Nicole, if you're still with us, uh, I think probably the Joseph Gerardo uh, interview kept you awake. So um, maybe you would be willing to share with us, with our uh, listeners, how to get in touch with us for Deep Waters. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And thanks, Joseph. Loved hearing your story. Thank you. Um, yeah, Deep Waters would love to hear from you. You can reach us at deepwatersrecovery.com. We post weekly blogs from our community. Uh, this podcast comes out weekly. Uh, you can follow us on all the social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, and then maybe YouTube. It's the Recovery Crew. Um, and our number is 512-677-7847. Or you can email me at admin at deepwatersrecovery.com uh, to find out any information about um, our program. Nice. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole is our program manager and admissions coordinator uh, Deep Waters Recovery is an online 10-hour program, uh, Recover, Heal, Launch. Uh, and you can go on our website and find out way more than you need to know about all that. Uh, and we're also a weekend Deep Waters Intensive. And uh, I think that's all I feel like saying about that today. You know how to get a hold of us. Thanks, everyone, for being a part of this movement. We consider this to be a movement. It's not just for a bunch of crazy people who used to be under the, almost either almost under the bridge or under the bridge. We we have a sense that the world is hurting and wants to turn that hurt into gold, you know. And this is an invitation for everybody to get on this beautiful train. You could look as good as Joseph Gerardo if you did this work. <laughs> better, better. You, Tell me yeah, you can look better. Yeah, I better make it, actually more like Nicole. You could look like Nicole if you just. Uh, but and you might even get. A, will you show us that tattoo one more time before we get out of here? And I'm going to describe one? for the one? either one. I like the one behind the ear the best. Actually, look at that. That is, is that a cool tattoo or what? That's a bass clef sign, man. If I was going to get one, it would be something in that. So it's right in behind it. For those of you that are not on the video version, uh, you'll have to go to YouTube to really. That tattoo. That tattoo actually changed my life because the the guy that hired me for Recovery Unplugged, he said that when he met me, he liked me, and then he saw the tattoo and he was like, "That's the guy." Hey, I'm telling you, man, I had the same experience with you. He might just be a calm, like, regular dude, but he's got a tattoo of a bass clap behind his ear. Oh, yeah, there's more to this story. All right, so uh, I think that's it, folks. Uh, you'll you'll see uh, uh, on our on our website, and it'll also be on social media, uh, uh, Joseph's blog, which will be interesting, too. Um, anyway, thanks, everybody, for being here. You're in the deep waters now. Boom. See, I know I've got uh, I know I've got musicians and performers who know to leave the silence. Thank you. God damn it. Yeah. No shit. It's a, I've noticed it every time because everybody else said we're in the deep waters now. Oh, thanks, Bob. I like no, no, you shut up for a second. <laughs>